This is episode 55 of a series where we examine the cut content, design, and development of Fallout New Vegas. In today's episode, we'll be covering a wide array of subjects and a few mods. If you're interested in checking any of them out, there's a link to them in the description. Bethesda considered a different interface setup for stealth before deciding on the Hidden Caution Detected Danger system, as there's an unused alternate indicator from Fault 3 in FNV's game files. It's a series of circles that presumably would have started small and would have grown larger until the player was discovered. There's a slider in the bottom right, but it's more difficult to say how it was meant to be used. There's also a file called Stealth Meter, which might have been used along with the circle. It's possible Obsidian considered using these, but they're most likely just legacy content from Bethesda. Regardless, it's an interesting artifact of Fall 3's development. This pre-release magazine scan shows a beta version of the Vigor Tester. The layout is rearranged a bit, the font is different, and the description for strength has extra flavor text. The final version stops short after how much help is gonna be for you in a saloon brawl, but the beta version continues saying with his fist or his trusty boot knife. Speaking of the Vigor Tester, it notes that agility increases movement speed and this is repeated in the official guide. However, the player moves at the exact same speed regardless of agility, and the only glitchless way to increase movement speed are the Tunnel Runner and Travel Light perks. It's strange they went out of their way to mention this multiple times considering it has no effect, and I can't help but wonder if they meant to add it in but never had time or if they had some issue implementing it. Luckily for us, Modder Brainbox LTD made a mod that changes agility to affect player movement speed, which is a great addition. Modder Crygreg restored some unused weather settings that were intended for the Hoover Dam battle and the Legate boss fight. These really make the final battle seem more ominous and dramatic than what was used, so I'm not sure why they were replaced. One of these cut weather types was shown in the making of documentary and must have been cut relatively late. All of the signs used at Camp McCarran are contained within this texture file, and some of them are unused. The fission chip sign seems like it should have been used at the restaurant run by Corporal Farber. It's possible it was cut as a design decision, but it's equally plausible that there was meant to be another restaurant in the terminal. There's also signs for Sky High Club, ticketing, two gates, gates, and baggage claim, none of which are used. It's possible that some of these were intended to appear in the cut terminal cell and were cut alongside it. There's a marker for a meat preparation animation from Fault 3 placed at Camp McCarran, but it's never used. There's an area at the fort that seems to have been set up for this animation too, but it was never completed either. This would have given NPCs more to do, so it's too bad it was cut. Modern Blooper Reel recently restored this and also added the animation to other areas. Doc Mitchell has two very strange death response lines. They sound like sound files from some older Obsidian game, but I'm not sure what they're from. These are probably the single strangest lines in the entire game and were presumably used as placeholders, but Doc Mitchell's voice actor never recorded this dialogue, so the character has no death responses in the final game. Darn it. What a waste. NPCs play death lines after a nearby character is killed. Death response lines are different and are only played in response to another nearby NPC playing a death line. At least, that's the way they're supposed to work, but death responses are broken in the final game and never play. It goes even further, as all combat reaction dialogue is broken, at least until they were fixed by the JIP NVSE mod. That means the vast majority of players have never heard any of the combat responses for the large number of characters who have them. There are some bizarre lines in a folder called Robot Liberty Prime. You'd think these would be Liberty Prime sound effects from Fallout 3, but they're more like joke dying sounds. It seems that Bethesda used these as placeholders to test Liberty Prime. That, we all 
I've mentioned the player could once free the Big Horners in Good Springs to cause panic during the quest Run Good Springs Run. Joe Cobb still has some unrecorded player lines related to this. What's the point of freeing the Big Horners and the Big Horners are loose? In the final game, Joe Cobb is voiced by Avery Waddell, but Joe Cobb has some unused dialogue that was recorded by a different, unknown voice actor. These very well might be some of the dev team's temp VO, most of which was recorded by Jason Fader, and it might be his voice. He's some traitor who decided he'd rather shoot than pay the toll for being in our territory. He's hiding somewhere in town. That's how you want to play it, huh? There are too many places to hide around here. He'd see me coming and then BAM, I'm dead. He doesn't know you though. He probably won't shoot right away. Alright, let's do this. Stay out of our way. Another developer who helped with the temp VO was unpaid intern Frida Wolf. She worked on both Obsidian's cancelled Alien game and New Vegas, but was laid off at some point during the latter's development. Despite that, she left her mark on New Vegas quite literally. At Hidden Valley, there's graffiti that reads LVA Class of 99 Rules, which is a reference to the year she graduated from Las Vegas Academy of the Arts High School, also known as LVA. As far as I'm aware, none of her temp VO remains, but in an awesome little redemption story, she would go on to voice minor characters in Fault 4 and Fault 76. The Legget has a line called Legget Give Thanks. I'm pretty sure this isn't used in any of the Legget scenes, but either way, it's pretty funny. Like the tops, the Gamora's interior was heavily reworked at some point in development. Footage from the Making of documentary shows the casino floor was twice as large as it is in the final game. There's even evidence that the basement level and casino floors were a single massive area. Outside the doors that exit the basement, there are still inaccessible hallways that were likely once connected to the casino. If you copy the lower levels and paste them into the casino, the levels still match up perfectly. For comparison, here's how the casino appears in the final game, and here's how it appeared at E3. Here's the E3 casino reconnected to the basement, which would have made it one of the largest interiors in the game, and it gives you an idea of how impressive the casinos were meant to be. Interestingly, the original interior can still be seen in the Gamora second poster. The scale of this area must have caused serious frame rate issues, so the casino and basement were split into two separate cells, and the casino floor was cut in half. The Gamora lost a lot of what the developers intended in this transition, and parts of the casino that were once beautiful became forgettable. Probably the best example of this is the area where Big Sal is found. Originally, this area had a view of the casino and looked amazing, but once the casino was reduced in size, they placed these walls to hide the fact there's nothing behind them. At some point after E3, the designers added a large number of water stains to the casino floors to make them look more run down. All of these were removed from the Gamora in a patch though, likely for performance concerns. Thankfully, Modder Ludo restored this in his mod Gamora Casino Uncut. A significant amount of work went into examining the original layout and early footage, and what remained of it in the game files, then painstakingly recreating it. This is a truly fantastic mod, and in my opinion, it's the definitive mod for the casino. The Gamora has a few other oddities worth talking about. Its third poster depicts an earlier version of its exterior and the strip. A road split off from Las Vegas Boulevard and looped around the Gamora's entrance, but this would be trimmed down into a small section of sidewalk. There's some objects decorating the sidewalk on either side of the road too, but it's hard to say what they are. 
The sign was placed directly in front of the casino, rather than off to the side. You can clearly see the lights in the windows lit up, something that never happens in-game, and the casino itself is even facing in a different direction. To the left of the casino was an expansive open area, but this was later replaced by junk walls. There are two lights hidden inside the curtains in the stage area the player can normally never see. This suggests the stage was once larger, and it actually continues outside the playable area, which you can still see by clipping out of bounds. There are some unused lights in the test map called Star Hanging Light Orange and Green. The Gamora already has some hanging lights, and it's possible they were intended to be used here, but this is speculation as there's nothing tying them to the strip. There's a couple interesting props in the lower levels called Gamora Interior Sign Frame 02, but they aren't actually holding a sign, and it's unknown if this sign still exists. These props are only used in one area, and Sign Frame 01 isn't even in the game files, which suggests that some of the Gamora's assets were deleted during this rework. If you clip outside the bank area, you'll find three safes you can normally never see. These containers are used to hold the player's weapons and companion weapons when they enter the Gamora. Random FNV Fact Audio director Scott Lawler revealed that the dev team recorded some of the game's ambient sounds. Recording in the Obsidian Lobby We got a group of 15 or so developers together in our lobby and directed their performance. This is a big part of the sound of the casinos in the game, especially the Gamora. In the original release, Philip Lim, a powder ganger at Vault 19, wore tortoiseshell glasses from Fallout 3. They look pretty cool, right? Well, hopefully you don't like them too much, because his inventory was changed by a patch to contain three dog sunglasses instead. He was the only source of tortoiseshell glasses, and as a result, they can never be found short of using console commands. I can understand why many of the patch changes were made, but this one is outright baffling. Vault 19's true purpose was to study paranoia, and to facilitate this, the inhabitants were broken into blue and red factions. Each faction had their own overseer, both of which were in on the experiment, and they induced paranoia on the vault's inhabitants through high-pitched sounds, equipment malfunctions, and other non-chemical methods. The Red Overseer's terminal can be found near Samuel Cook, but it can't be accessed. There are two terminal entries for it, and it's unknown if these were cut on purpose or if their exclusion was a mistake, but they do shed a bit more light on Vault 19. The first entry reads, There's something strange about the other Overseer. Maybe we were given different orders. Maybe this is all in my head. The experiments we're conducting must be starting to affect me. The noises? I'm sure there's an explanation for them. I'll have to write to him. After all, we aren't to be seen speaking to each other. Tomorrow then, maybe after a good night's sleep, my mind will be in better order. The second entry reads, Again, not two hours after I had fallen asleep, I heard that noise again. It's mechanical. Like something heavy being pushed, then it's hard to describe. Something that sounds like an elevator, perhaps? I've seen the blueprints of the vault. There is no way there could be an elevator there. What would it lead to? I think I'll take a walk around the second floor. It is late. No one will notice me. Besides, if anyone did, it might be good for the experiment anyway. Not far from the Devil's Throat, there is a wild wasteland encounter with a giant undetonated bomb called the One. The player could once salvage many nukes from the bomb, but that part of the script was later disabled. The Securitrons have an unused texture called Mr. House Alert that depicts a cop. It's possible this was a placeholder screen for the Securitrons, or perhaps it was somehow related to Mr. House's lockdown event, but it's impossible to be sure. They also have some unused textures where their screens would turn red in combat, which would have been a great touch. There's a couple unused graffiti assets. The first warns the player that there are raiders ahead. There's graffiti that says keep out that's used several times throughout the core game. 
However, there's also a red version of it that has paint dripping from some of the letters that was never used. There's graffiti used in game that reads fuck NCR and it's written out vertically. There's a horizontal version of this that was cut though. The texture files for Miguel's pawn shop says fast cash, but in game, it only says cash. The building itself was originally designed to be a single story, but a second story was later tacked on. As a result, you can normally never see these cool pipes stemming out from the roof. After FNV's release, 24 of the crafting recipes were patched to be easier to make. For instance, in the final game, Hydra is crafted using 1k fungus, 2 night stalker blood, and 1 rat scorpion poison gland. In the original release, it required 5k fungus, 2 night stalker blood, and 3 rat scorpion glands. Tan gecko hide can be crafted using one gecko hide, one turpentine, and one white horse nettle. But it originally required five white horse nettle. Speaking of white horse nettle, its form ID is named white horse nettle berries, which makes more sense considering you harvest the berries from the plant, but for some reason that part of the name was dropped. These crafting changes were pretty sensible, considering how difficult some items were to create. If you want a more difficult crafting experience, or are just interested in the original design, Modder Umbersona restored all of these in his mod Unpatched Recipes. A while back I talked about the Laser PDW, the cut unique variant of the Laser RCW. From its sound file, it seems to have fired a continuous beam. In a forum spring post, Josh Sawyer revealed why no laser or plasma weapons fire a sustained beam. We tried implementing continuous beam weapons, and they were catastrophically buggy. There were only two wacky things we tried doing for weapons, neither of which seemed like they would be difficult to implement. Continuous beams were cut relatively early. Looping reloads for weapons like the lever action guns turned out to be a long-term problem. Early on, the system just manifested a few edge case bugs, so we kept squashing those bugs, but others would spring up. It was very odd because it did not initially seem like a system that would be particularly problematic. As Josh alluded to, looping reloads were incredibly buggy. In the original release, it was possible to get stuck in an infinite reload animation. Sometimes bugs become features though, and one of these bugs has become an integral part of speedrunning the game. The 357 revolver has a cut alternate reload animation. This style of reloading was used in some early revolvers, and it was a pretty cool idea. The animation was never completed, but I made a small mod that restores it anyway. There's similar alternate reloads for the hunting shotgun and lever action shotgun, but both are very unfinished. It's possible these reloads were meant for unique variants of these weapons, but they were probably used as placeholder animations before looping reloads were implemented. There are two cells called OV Sleep Cell 1 and 2. The first one has a series of doors that aren't linked to the wasteland and a bunch of bedrolls. The second cell is a small dark room without doors or beds. The prefix OV stands for Outer Vegas and was used for a handful of areas, including the sewer systems, the Gray, West Side, and North Vegas. Some of the static doors near West Side have names like OV Street to Sleep Door Reference, and it seems like they might have been linked to the OV Sleep Cells at one point. It's difficult to say exactly what these were used for. They might have been placeholders that were used before interiors were completed completed, or perhaps it was an abandoned system where NPCs would be sent to these cells at night, giving the illusion of a real day-night cycle in town, but without having to create individual interiors for all of them. In the final game, both cells seem to be unused however, and many of the NPCs in these areas just sleep on the streets, rather than inside interiors. These changes would have made FNV into an even better game. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor. 